Hello, everybody, and welcome to Between Two Fans and uh, some some breaking news. Dan Scott has officially left the podcast for this week. Um, he, yeah, in case in case you're looking at uh, at why he's looking a little bit uh, better shaved, and uh, yeah, well, you, yeah, in fact, I think you're actually the same age, to be fair. So uh, it's a nice replacement to have. Um, Mr. Alistair Block, how are you? No, I'm good, Stevie. It's a pleasure to be on the show today. Thanks, thanks for the invite. I'm glad that Dan's busy gallivanting there in Italy, giving me a chance to show him how to actually make some predictions. So, yeah. 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 So, so for those of you who expect to see Mr. Dan Scott, he is currently in Sicily. Uh, it's a tough life out there. Uh, and uh, he's, he's experiencing some genuine third world problems in his first world country with the lack of Wi-Fi. And as such, we've had to to bring in the big guns. So uh, we do have Mr. Alistair Block, who, for a bit of background, is an Arsenal supporter for his sins, is a Shark supporter for his sins, and uh, even more so for his sins, is also a Springbok, well, a, a protein supporter. And then I mean, Springbok supporters, that's where, we, that's where we really sort of, uh, we get one back. Um, you know, that keeps us safe. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so, I think it's I'll... yeah, but it's yeah, short, right. but I ask more. You guys are missing some quality on the show, have some support. Well, at least the Sharks coming in with the trophy. Um, I suppose <laughs> it's about the only only thing that they contributed towards the the, the season so far. But uh, oh, before yeah, we get stuck thanks. in, um, we'll, we'll 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 update the the, the, the listeners uh, on the predictions. So every week, myself and Dan make predictions, and we've got a running total. And we have said the first one to get to 15, we'll have to do a episode of podcast in a rival jersey. So, for example, man, uh, Dan and Nucky United jersey, Stephen and Arsenal with Liverpool jersey, uh, and the likes. Uh, the score was about at one stage, um, Steve had a massive lead. Dan has been clawing it back slowly but steadily. It was 9 8 coming into this episode. So, let's just go through that before we then uh, chat about a bit of rugby. So, well, uh, we had three predictions last week it was Northampton versus Bath, Glasgow versus Stormers, and the Proteas versus the Netherlands. First up was Northampton versus Bath. I said uh, Bath by five. Dan went Saints by three. Um, so uh, Bath losing that 25 points, 21. So Saints claiming that the English Premiership, um, they were the best side all season. So so very deserved. So Dan does take that one. I was really hoping to see Finn Russell clutch up that red card, uh, potentially uh, a bit of a game changer. Um, so Dan gets one there. But Glasgow versus Stormers, I said Glasgow by six. Dan said Glasgow, I'm sorry, Stormers by three. He went with his heart and it was a poor decision. They ended up losing by 17. So I grab a big dub there by virtue of going with my Glasgow. And then we went Proteus versus Netherlands. And uh, Steve says by 30 runs or five wickets. Dan said 40 runs or seven wickets. It was a four wicket victory by the Proteus. So Steve has stemmed the flow, taken a 10 points to eight lead. And uh, Dan's going to have no say about what happens next week as well because uh, he has a proxy in the form of Alistair, who will be uh, coining those predictions uh, at the end of the show. So, uh, yeah, I'll no, no pressure because Dan was making a nice comeback, but, uh, yeah, I don't know, 11, 11 8 suddenly becomes a bit ominous. So I hope, you, hope you're ready for it. No, no, no. Not to worry. Dan, I've got you. I want to see Steve in an Arsenal show as much as you do on this show. So this week's predictions, I've got you down, my boy. Don't stress. Don't stress. I- I think my biggest worry is more the fact of trying to find an Arsenal shirt that I might actually fit me. Um, <laughs> uh, it's going to be very sort of tight, tight shirts out here, which, is, which I don't think is what the viewers want to see. That might have to be a genuine podcast <laughs> episode. Um, but, oh, let's, let's get into some ruggers um, because we had the URC quarterfinals last week and uh, we'll, we'll go through the games here. Munster beating Ospreys 23 points to 7. Bulls winning 30 points to 23 against Benetton. Leinster beating Ulster 43 points to 20. The only sort of real blowout win there and Glasgow beating Stormers 27 points to 10. Um, oh, before we sort of get stuck on some of the individual ones, a, a fair reflection, I suppose, of, of the table in that all the home sides won and the top four are indeed our top four. So, do you think we genuinely now have our top four best sides in the URC in the semifinals this weekend? Oh, well, the Sharks aren't there, so no, no, I'm kidding. The Sharks were awful this season. But, yeah, looking at it, Steve, uh, I, I think so. Um, I, I'm disappointed not to see Stormers there, you know, given that in the past few seasons they've been winning their quarterfinals, getting to the semis, getting to the finals, even winning the whole thing. The first time the South African teams were there. But Glasgow this season particularly towards the latter half, have just been immense and they deserve to be their top four, absolutely. 
Yeah, so I think let's let's just sort of stuck into some of the individual games there. So so Bulls versus Benz, I think, is one I want to talk about because the Bulls, who have been running in tries for fun and and looked really good, struggled uh, a little bit in this game, which I think sort of shows you how um play of rugby can be can be quite predictable. I think genuinely, I think if they were away, I think Benton could have done the job. But uh what do you sort of put that down to? Do you think a bit of nerves for the Bulls? I mean, obviously missing a couple of key players in the likes of no Ken Moody, no Kurt Lawrence who's injured last week and stuff, but uh it looked nervy from the Bulls. Uh, you know, what what do you, what do you reckon was was the cause of that? Yeah, look, you could never ride off Benton, Steve. Those guys have been pretty immense the whole season. Um Particularly at home, away they've been strong as well. I mean, you know, look, they, they did themselves. I don't want to say a disservice by beating the Sharks because obviously that got them into the, the the quarterfinals. But that win away at the Sharks was really good. Um, Bulls themselves, you never know. Like you say, playoff rugby, it's intense, it's unpredictable. Um, can't say that the Benison team wasn't used to the heat from what Dan's Instagram stories are saying. It's looking quite hot and nice there in Italy. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's also just could be a thing of Bulls and um, perhaps underestimating their opponents. Um, Italian team coming over, a bit of jet lag. Well, I don't know if jet lag's the right term, but certainly being tired from all the travel they've done in the mm-hmm. past few weeks could have been a factor. But, yeah, it was nervy for the Bulls there, but they got the job done. Um, only South African team left and I hate to say it but I'm backing them all the way yeah it's an interesting one I think the Bulls for me this season they've scored a lot of points but they've they, their defence has been a bit leaky and they're playing against Lens mm. this weekend which is a side that, that scores points for fun really I mean I'm putting 40 points past Austin in the playoff game um, maybe also a little bit leaky in the fact that they can see a 20 but um yeah, I think I mean, going into this game before we sort of talk about Glasgow and, and Munster, you know, w- w- do you think that's that's is? I mean, is it safe to say that'll be the difference? You know, if the Bulls are to pull off the spectacular and knock Leinster out, they're going to have to sort the defence out. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, I don't think it helped them losing Kirtley and was it like the 29th minute or so, and he had already yeah. scored two tries at that point. Um, Kirtley is immense on defence. Um, people think you know, like he's a small guy, but he brings legs down. Um, leaky defense could be an issue for them but um, yeah look the Bulls attacking threat we've seen throughout the season has been wild um, even though they're shipping like 23 against Benetton in the quarterfinal and I think a couple of weeks before that they shipped 35 against them at home in the league stages the group stages rather um, but then they went on to put 56 on, the, on Benetton in that game 40 on Glasgow, 61 on Ospreys, 40 on Stormers. Their attack is, is, is <clears throat> excuse me, it's really effective. Um, but against a team like Leinster, however, or Ireland, <laughs> that's effectively who they're playing, that, that leaky defense right might really be a problem, particularly if they play the way they did against Benetton. Leinster won't be so forgiving. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's that's, yeah. I think I think both teams as well. I think I think it's going to be. It could potentially be a, a high scoring game. Um, considering that there were fifty mm-hmm. points at Loftus last week, there were, um, sixty points plus at uh, in 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 Dublin. So potentially a high scoring game, which could create a bit of a thriller. Um, I suppose you know both teams will be backing themselves to to score some points. Uh, Glasgow beating Stormers. Before we talk about their chances against Munster, let's just talk about the Stormers a little bit about. A disappointing performance. Um, Mon Liebach boots not quite on song. The Stormers sort of maybe not quite where they where they needed to be. Um, you know, the Stormers have had a lot of success in the playoffs in the last few years. They've had back to back finals, but that home advantage has always been such a big thing. Uh, do you think you put it? You, do you put it down to that sort of a way? Uh, the four G pitch, the conditions, stuff like that. You know, I mean, are Stormers is it is it unfair to call them sort of home bullies? I don't know if it's unfair to call them that. Like, I mean, you and Scotty spoke about it last week. Um, Stormers away, their travel form has been shocking. Um, mm-hmm. I think the only South African team that actually traveled really well was the Lions, who unfortunately couldn't continue to show that travel away from getting put to eighth place by the Ospreys of all people. But, um, yeah, I'll have you. Yeah, no, I understand. But uh, Stormers away on a 4G pitch, South African teams on a 4G pitch, always looking a little bit dicey. Um, Glasgow really turned up. It was a bit of an interesting first half that quite low scoring until, you know, 60th minute when Consilier and Fencer got over the line. Um, it was looking really close, but um, ultimately that, that Stormers away form just showed in the quarterfinal. They weren't up for it. 
Yeah, no, I mean, a word about Martin Liebach, for example, it's 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 always such a, a tricky one to talk about, but, you know, he missed borderline everything last week. I think like, he basically did miss everything. Mm-hmm. A d- difficult, difficult conversation to have, but, you know, do you think this is something that the Stormers need to now start basically embracing and almost sort of saying, listen, we know that his goal kicking is very inconsistent, that he has his days and he can have his off days, um, you know, do you think this is something that, like you're know, moving on, looking ahead, even maybe in a Springbok point of view, that you've got to look at if he plays, you have to have a potential second goal kicking option? And uh, you know, how how do, how do you think you then negotiate that? Well, from a Springbok point of view, we saw the door. See, Masuku's in, and does Hajjai Pollard know about this? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, for the Stormers, it's it's dicey. Um, me not being a Stormers fan, I'm not actually sure what other goal-kicking options they have. Um, and look, I, I, I don't want to be a money hater. I love the guy. Um, mm. He has made clutch kicks for the Stormers in playoff games before. He's won them the URC title. His, if we're talking purely kicking, yeah, it's different because you can't judge money solely on his kicking. His His infield play is just crazy, which is yeah. why it's difficult to consider um, him only as a kicker. But when it gets to those clutch moments in the playoff game and Marnie's not on song, it, you are going to need a, a backup kicker to, to, to make those clutch kicks. And for the Stormers, I'm not quite sure who's going to step up and do that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I suppose, you know, Damien Williams, uh, you know, can be an option when he plays, but he's also, you know, not been known yeah. for his goal kicking. When Sasha Fabian Gomezudi is playing, he's got a very good percentage. Apparently, he had a bit of a niggle this last weekend, which prevents him from taking it. But I think it is a, a genuine bit of a problem for the Stormers because when he's on song, as you say, you know, what he does in the, in the sort of the general field is, is untouchable. But he did leave out about 15, 16 points last week, um, which, which does yeah. change the entire sort of complexion uh, of the game. Now, Glasgow Warriors, though. Uh, they're my second side when it comes to the URC. Love watching them play. They're up against the current champions. Um, are we giving them a chance this weekend? Yo, Glasgow against Munster. Look, uh, I'd love, I'd love to see them do it, but I just, I just can't, can't see them getting it done. Munster are too strong. They're going to get the job done. Yeah, fair enough. Look, well, so, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you there, but. Um, Look, their the last game that they played at Munster, they lost 40 points to 29. And um, last season's quarterfinal was also against Munster at home. They lost 14 points to 5. I know it's a whole season ago, but um, mm. Munster have experience at this level in the tournaments. Glasgow, not so much. Um, I'm uh, not wrong in saying that this would be the first Scottish team ever to reach a final if they do. Great. Which just shows yeah. that they don't have you know, well, I'm not sure if they don't have the BMT, but they don't have the experience at this level that Munster do, particularly at Thomond Park, where they've been crazy good. Yeah, no, I think it's 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 a fair point. I think and I think Munster, you know, you got your big you got big band players in Munster. You know, Jack Crowley's mm. becoming a becoming a world class fly half. You've got Chapito Marnie's your Ty Burns, your Achis Naimans, for example, Simon Zebo, uh, yeah. somebody's been playing really well in the last couple of games. So yeah, I do think it's those sort of those big players you can stand up, but from a African perspective, it is a Carl Stein captained uh, Glasgow Warriors. So, you know, you got to you got to want you, we want them to succeed. We want to see our other uh, product uh, that we that we produce. Actually, in Carl Tig, um, you know, it's, it's so captaining the Glasgow Warriors, uh, coached by Stafkin as well. Franco Smith, plenty of, of Stafkins there. So, I'll, I'll definitely be rooting for Glasgow Warriors. It would also mean that should Glasgow Warriors beat Munster and Bulls manage to beat Leinster, it will be a Bulls home final. Where that final might take place, we still sort of remain to be seen because there could be issues with the inaugurations and the likes. Um, yeah, but interesting of, chat that, yeah. Yeah, so Literally you can see uh, Orlando Stadium, for example, an F&B Stadium, an Ellis Park. Uh, well, Bulls have won the Super Rugby at Orlando Stadium, eh? so there's history yeah. there. There is history yeah. there. Take it back to Soweto. Um, I'd be interested to see how many, so, I mean, if they were to go to, for example, an F&B Stadium, I'd love to know how many tickets they could potentially sell. Um, you know, could they put 40, 50,000 people in that stadium for, for a URC final? The issue, of, of course, would be it's the same day as the Springbok game. So, you know, timing would be everything. Um, yeah. Springboks do play Wales next week. Yeah. Right. So in terms of just some, a bit of an update, as mentioned, Northampton Saints beating Bath. Um, so Ben Obama got a red card, um, which I think had a big impact on the game. But uh, the nice news, for example, is Courtney Laws is send-off. 
um, you know, goat player really for England and for for Northampton. I mean, I think probably one of the, like the ultimate players, isn't he? Just in terms of unassuming, very quiet, gets along, gets to his work. But I think it's something like, you know, he's never received like uh, uh, something something ridiculous about sort of his high tackle stats. You know, like how many tackles he's made and never like been penalised for high tackle or something. He's just. Well, one of the ultimates, isn't it? When you, when you when you talk about players who you are sort of you don't maybe are always in the headlines, but just you never really see them have a bad game. Courtney Laws is definitely one of those. Yeah, look, I've always enjoyed watching him. Um, sticking to the rules, and just like some other stats that he's had there at Northampton, he's played two hundred and eighty-two games across seventeen seasons for one club. That's a talk about a one-club man and a yeah. dream send-off for the guy. That's crazy to win your. I think it's only his second title. Um, to do that in his last season, it's just a, it's a fever dream. Congrats yeah, to him. And, uh, and deserved. And he's going to a, a Pro D2 side next season, so very much going to a project uh, team, the same yeah. side that has signed uh, Cohen Bosch, which is, which is going to be interesting to see what Breve do uh, next season. Obviously, mm-hmm. big ambition there uh, down at the Pro D2 to be signing sort of players of that kind of caliber. Uh, then looking ahead, before we talk about the big rugby news, uh, Super Rugby semi-finals this weekend. Um, we've got the Blues up against the Brumbies on Friday tomorrow at 9 o'clock. We've got Hurricanes versus Chiefs at Hopper Six on Saturday. Um, so, Al, are you going to be keeping an eye on the Super Rugby? Have you been keeping an eye on the Super Rugby? Do we have uh, any sort of favours to what to, to what we were hoping to see this weekend? Yeah, look, I've been keeping an eye on the results happening. I haven't been watching much of the rugby except when, you know, Moana Pacifica and Fiji Drew are playing because um, those guys, they just bring the flair, Steve. I enjoy watching them particularly when they're playing in Fiji as well. The fans, those guys are crazy. And um, look, credit must be given to Fiji and Drua as well. These guys put in a big shift in their plays. Only, I think, their third season in Super Rugby, finishing 11th in their first season and our seventh two seasons in a row making the quarterfinals. Of course, they got they got pretty pumped by the Blues. Um, yeah. But making it to the playoffs, you know, it's, it's impressive. Um, they play some attractive rugby when it works. It's true Fiji and flair. No, I love it. I love it. But other than that, um, yeah, I've not been watching much Super Rugby since we left. I think the quality of Super Rugby is seriously deteriorated, you know, without the South African quality there. But interesting tournament nonetheless. Um, yeah, should we go through these results here, Steve? Yeah, so last weekend, uh, Chiefs beating Red, uh, Reds 43 points to 21. Um, very much uh, sort of setting the standards. Hurricanes hammering Rebels 47 points to 20. Blues beating Fiji and Drew at 35 points to 5. And then Brumbies beating the Highlanders uh, 32 points to 16. So Brumbies very much the Australian um, hopes and dreams uh, of, of rugby. And, and it's been an interesting week for Australian rugby because uh, the Melbourne Rebels have officially gone under. Mm. They, they will no longer be involved. Always a bit of a weird kind of franchise, but obviously massive for Melbourne to lose the, the rugby. But also massive news is Carter Gordon has made the switch to to NRL, uh, following the likes of Mark yeah. Um oh not not all things not well in Australian rugby, eh? Yeah, look, no, the, this whole Melbourne Rebels fiasco is ridiculous, Steve. That's um Australian rugby they rejected a business rescue deal for, you know, rescuing the Rebels from a wealthy consortium. Um, from what I've seen. And given where Australian rugby are right now, they need their best players to continue playing rugby union. The Wallabies are in an absolute shambles at the moment, losing the likes of Carter Gordon and Mark, whatever the man's surname is, don't ask me to pronounce it. <laughs> now, I'm going to what I say. It just takes a couple of practices. <laughs> losing them to, to league is, is really not good for Australian rugby. Um, and that's a whole new franchise down the drain. It's a sad thing as well, given that the Rebels was their first time ever in a playoff game in their what, 11, 12-year history. They made it to the quarterfinals for the first time, and now all of a sudden, Rugby Australia is like, cheers, Oaks, you're gone. Sorry. First, first gone and last. Here. Yeah. Shame. No, it's a shame. I'm not happy with it. Yeah, it's it's so. T- I mean, you got you got you got a British and Irish Lions series next year. You got a World Cup in two years' time. You know, this was supposed to be the the regen of Australian rugby, and unfortunately, um, with the you know administration issues, that's been under a lot of pressure. A lot of people have called them out. Um, but you know, you talk about two players who were supposed to be you know part of the spine 
of of Australian rugby for many years to come. You yeah. know, Noel Alessio, Cody Gordon. I mean, they were going to be fighting out for for ten the next few years. You know, Mark Nwanguwe to us. I mean, I watched him at the World Cup. He's a special, special player. So to be losing those kind of mm. players is is everything you can't afford to do. Um, and I think it kind of shows you exactly how Australian rugby is such in such a precarious position where if they don't get the right decisions and they don't start making the big decisions, then I think you know the Wallabies are going to be down to almost a tier two nation in a few years' time if they don't if they don't be careful, which is sad to see because you know from a Australian perspective we want to we want to play against a decent Australian yeah. side. Um, they've got so much history. They've won Absolutely. a World Cup. You know, absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to see Australian just going down, doing going down the drain. We can't speak too early because um, obviously they are hosting the World Cup in 2027, two and a half years from now. But um, you know, it would just be a damn shame to see them hosting the World Cup and crashing out in the group stages or just being, you know, non-competitive at all. Like you yeah. said, I really enjoy seeing a competitive Australia in the rugby championship. It can't just be us in New Zealand as the only powerhouses in the South. You know, we've been carrying the South for too long now. It's, it's time for Australia to really pick their socks up. And um, it's, it's not happening. Rebels going under. Results not going Australia's way on the field when they do play on and off the field, yeah. really. Um, yeah, it's, it's a shame to see, Steve. Yeah, right. Well, whilst the Wallabies, whilst the Wallabies disintegrate, the Springboks are growing. And we have our first ever Springbok uh, well, first, the first Springbok squad of the year and lots of big decisions uh, with eight, with 12 uncapped players, in fact, in the squad. Uh, so it was announced on Monday. Um, if you have not seen the full squad, you can go check out a couple of the updates on uh, the Ferris Sports channel. But uh, in terms of the big names, some uncapped players, the likes of Nietzsche Vashir, Ben Jason Dixon, uh, Pepsi Butelezi, all the uncapped um, forwards, as well as Peter Gamedi, who's been added to the side as well later. Uh, and then if you look at the backline players, uh, Morning Funnenberg, Ethan Hooker, Jordan Hendricks, uh, Sia Masuku, Edward Funnenberg, Sasha Feinberg, Gomazulu, as well as Kwan Horn, all added there. Honda Pollard, yes, he's currently with the squad, but unavailable for Wales. I mean, oh, you mentioned Sia Masuku earlier, but there's oh. some there's some exciting players in, this, in, in the uncapped players. That have been there's names you've just read. Just, they, 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 they excite me, Steve. It's, mm. it's insane. These are uncapped Springbok players. You've got 12 of them there. And they've all got bright futures. Uh, the, the likes of, I mean, Pepsi's been knocking on the door for a while. Um, ben, Jason Dixon, I had no clue who this Oak was before the season started. Yeah, now you get him playing. Yo, oh, they're at the Stormers. He's been absolutely killing it. Q and Horn for the Lions. Um, I don't want to say he's been the spine of their attack, but when you give that man the ball in space, you can almost expect mm. to try between him and Nohamba, which I'm quite sad to see is not yet. To be honest, Steve, mm-hmm. I really think he deserves a, a spot. Um, but the Oaks that have been called up, um, Bilo Gumede, Edward van der Merwe, Netle Pachia, Andre Hugo Fenter excites me as well, Steve. It's really, our squad depth for the book is looking really, really good. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think this is just the initial squad that's particularly yeah. for the Wales series, right? Mm. Because um, I really would like to see the addition of the likes of Tyrone Green and Joano Augustus as well. But naturally, they play. They're based in England. I'm not sure if the clubs are allowed to release them. No. Yeah. Um, so, so regulation nine um, specifies that they cannot be released outside the window. So that's why, for example, Jasper Visa and Hunter Pod are, are have been allowed to train, but they cannot play. Andre Estehazen can play because whilst he is still under contract at the Harlequins, he's obviously making the move to Sharks next season. So they've basically said we don't yeah. really care. Go forth and play. It doesn't affect us. You know, you're not going to play for the Harlequins again. Um, so, yeah, so whether Tyron Green and Joan Augustus, for example, are on the radar, we'll wait and see, but there will be another squad announcement after after that Wales um, um, test. So this is purely just for, for next week, basically. They, uh, by the way, the team will be announced on Tuesday um, mm-hmm. before the squad leaves on Wednesday to play at Twickenham on Saturday against Wales. Uh, all, all, all those unpacked uh, players, uncapped so players. Also... Sorry? Sorry I'm, so, I'm so keen to see what that starting yeah. lineup's going to be because... I can't well, even begin to make a prediction. And Wim Rassi is always cooking. You know that. Yeah. Um, yeah no, he's always he's always something to sleep. But so, so I mean, which 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 yeah. of those uncapped players would you would you like to see in 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 that twenty three? Look, my biasness is going to come out here. I want to see Pepsi and Sia in the starting fifteen. <laughs> but um, truthfully, Steve, I mean, especially now that we've got injuries to Curtly Arensa, um, Chesley yeah. Colby's looking a bit shaky as well. I've heard he's, he's yeah. back in the camp with the box. Back in the, back um, in the camp, has not been cleared yet, Try, but won't, won't exactly, face away yeah. in a race against time for Ireland. Yeah, but it does open the door for the likes of Edward von der Merwe to play against Wales. And he's a speedster. He's fantastic on attack. Um, 
I'd like to see Q and Horn in there as well, given that, um, you know, Damien Phillips is out. Give him a shot at fullback, why not? Um, and also, we just we need to see the likes of Sasha Fenberg and Gomez Zulu. We need to give him that springboard cap just so we can tell England, hey, go away, you can't have him, he's ours. Yeah, nice, nice try, <laughs> nice try, not happening. <laughs> exactly. Um, which is also the same thing I wanted to see with the likes of Atira and Green. You know, Fuller, Fuller what, what Chelsea have been doing for years in the Premier League. Yeah. Sign all the oaks in the world just so no one else can have them. We must okay, do that. Yeah. Just just cap them. Just cap them. And if they don't play, they don't Absolutely. play. Cap them. Yeah. Just be spiteful, you know. Yeah, correct. Yeah, but so, yeah, we'll see that team named on, on Tuesday. Very excited to see. I think uh, also the officers big names like Malcolm Marks. Uh, back in it, uh, Sal Murat called back into that squad. Uh, he is capped, but the likes of a of a Intuku Unu, for example, also back in the squad. So a couple of players who are capped, but haven't played a lot of rugby at Springbok level, also including the squad. So expect to be a bit of a a, a chasey update. Fassi, for example, is capped, but back in the squad. Um, the other good news before we sort of move on to a bit of football is that the Curry Cup, by the way, if you have not uh, seen, will go ahead. Um, there is a new deal that has been put in place about the sort of the player welfare resting and uh, the core basics are as follows. Uh, it is a structured individualized eight week rest periods for all players with formal notice periods when such breaks are to be taken. Uh, there's an adoption of world rugby player load guidelines, which are in finalization, a maintenance of a strict individual player load monitoring program, a broadened scope for the joint committee on contract of player safety and welfare and utilization of the emergency committee to ensure effective implementation of the new arrangements and adjust travel arrangements for Vodacom, URC, EPCR teams from 1st July 2025. So we wouldn't be seeing those sort of long-haul flights. But I mean, for me, this doesn't, this makes sense. You know, I think, you know, it was, I, when I was looking at the initial issues and you're thinking that we can't have a curry cup because basically they're all saying that all the players have to rest at the same time seems a bit rudimentary. You know, these are professional athletes that do need to rest, stuff like that. But why can we not say, all right, cool, you know, you've had a bit of an injury. You come back. You start playing in January. You can get. You can keep playing for another two weeks, two two months in the Curry Cup, and then we will give you. You know, October, November. We'll give you six weeks off here and two weeks off here. And I, in, you know, in terms of well, the FB eight week rest periods, whether they're all going to be officially yeah. taken all the time. I mean, don't you think it's just a bit? You know, it seemed like it was just a bit. Yeah, basic to sit there and say, cool. Well, you know, they just have to all rest at the same time. Where you know, it should be so much more fluid. You know. Players, some players are playing 80 minutes every single week. Some players are playing 20 minutes, you know, and you can't yeah. treat these players exactly the same. It, it, it is a bit simplistic, Steve. They're not considering the reality of it as well. I mean, especially when there's lots of players not getting time. And something that, like, I really would have liked to have seen at the Sharks as a Sharks fan, I mean, it's a shame that he's leaving. But up here with Gianchi, got yeah. very little game time this season for the Sharks. I would have liked to have seen them go get some confidence back in the Curry Cup team and then come back next season yeah. and, you know, kill it at the Sharks. But unfortunately, it's not going to happen and now he's going to be scoring hella points at the Bulls, you know. Maybe he's just a hunting base good player because, you know, he was killing it at the Lions a couple of years ago and let's see if he can do it at the Bulls. But anyway, back to the Curry Cup, Steve. Um, it's nice to see that they're having a focus on player welfare and load monitoring, mm. but the way that they're approaching it with everyone resting at the same time, I think is just impractical. And it feeds into the issue that we've seen for the Curry Cup for many, many years now, is that the best players will not be playing. Yeah. Um, it, it, it sucks, because back when, when we were kids, Steve, we would turn on the Curry Cup, Iconic. and you'd Iconic. get Skull Bugger, busy mauling for Rie de Prier, you know? It was yeah. epic rugby, and stadiums were full. And the Curry Cup has lost that magic. And this yeah. um, is really not going to help everyone resting at the same time. Yeah, no, I think I think you know the reality is we currently still do have a dual schedule with being Northern Hemisphere for local, Southern Hemisphere for for international. You know, we're not an island, for example, who will play our two that two match test series and, and mid July they will not play rugby again in September. You know, so those players who are not going to um, to South Africa, for example, you know, the likes of a an Ulster, their season's done. Connacht, their season was done two weeks ago. So if you if you play for Connacht and you finished two weeks ago, you know, you can now have your eight-week period rest, um, which would have started on what, the the first of, the, the second of, of June, you can then, your eight yeah. weeks will then finish in July. You know, by August, you are ready to get back into pre-season, mid-season URC. It becomes easy. You know, even internationals, for example, they'll play until the second week of July. Their rest period will start, say, for example, Sunday the 14th of July. They can have that eight weeks and be done by about the end of August. By the end of September, they can start playing URC again and have that eight-week rest. So it's very easy for the Northern Hemisphere side. It's very easy for um, your Australia, New Zealand, for example, who 
will play the rugby championship, finish in September, you know, and you can have a full October off um, before you in all internationals. And, and then they've got that full December, basically January off as well. So it's, there's, there's those gaps. We don't have those gaps. And I think it was just far too, yeah, as you said, simplistic. And, and I, don't, I mean, this is logical. I don't understand why this is even like became a big thing. Surely you just sit there and say, right, well, we know this is not going to work. How do we make it work? Because, you know, you can't lose the Curry Cup, but we can't have a player who's playing 12 months every year as well. Well, Steve, we need to consider maybe the, the Oaks that sat down and made these rules are probably like cheaters or Griquas fans, you know, because it really works well for them. If the other yeah. teams stop playing or resting and not playing, cheaters just absolutely kill the Curry Cup win. And Pumas as well. Can't forget them. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah. Normally the three small teams, Griquas, Cheaters, Pumas, I don't want to be disrespectful, of course, but, um, you know, the non-URC teams, when, when the URC teams players are not there, they just walk the Curry yeah. Cup. And it's, it's good to see them do that. Um, but I would like to see, you know, a level of competition and excitement with the top players playing, like that back in the day when we were kids. I miss that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also the new format, you know, of there being two groups now, and you play everybody in your group uh, twice before playing uh, mm. everybody else, in the, you know, everybody else in the other group once, you know, so it reduces the the games from what would have been about 16 games, I think it was, or 14 games. You're going to be playing about 10 games now. Um, so there are fewer games as well. So you are reducing the player workload. I think also reducing the length of the tournament will keep it a bit more exciting. Um, you know, me and Dan have had the, have got the going uh, ongoing joke about how the IPL lasts about four months and you kind of just get over it. <laughs> so I think I think having yeah. it a bit more compact makes it a bit a bit more exciting as well, especially during Springbok season where you know we don't have a lot of rugby in the weekends. You know, we are, we can all sort of pivot around one game. So it's nice to have that. You know, when, if a boxer playing in, in, in Australia and you're playing at 7 o'clock, by 9 o'clock, your rugby's finished. No, you've got Curry Cup in the afternoon. It's going to be good Curry Cup as well. Mm. So very, very cool to see that they have sorted that out. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to the Curry Cups. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and still, we've got some football coming up in the Euros, the European Championship. Yeah, one do. of my favorite, favorite tournaments. Um, there's always drama in the Euros. There's always big upsets. There's Iceland beating England. There's... There's teams going on runs. Um, and, you know, from a club perspective, there's always those players that, for example, pop up. You know, Locatelli, last, 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 last tournament, nobody knew who he was. Came through, had the yeah. phenomenal tournaments. People, people grab name. So uh, that all kicks off tomorrow night. Uh, Germany versus Scotland. Or tonight, by the time you this comes out, this will be out on tomorrow morning. Germany versus Scotland. Scotland, that powerhouse nation, being led by the likes of Scott McTominay, Andy Robertson. Um, begin, you know, those go players. Uh, Germany will be Tony Cruz's last sort of send-off. Other fixtures, are, however, look on Saturday, Hungary versus Switzerland, Spain versus Croatia on Saturday, 6 o'clock. That's probably the, the game of the oh, weekend. Huge game. Um, huge game. That is the one we're going to be doing our predictions for. Um, you've then got Italy versus Albania on Saturday night, Poland versus Netherlands on Sunday, Slovenia versus Denmark, Serbia versus England. England, you know, one of the most talented squads they've got under Southgate. She's under a lot of pressure. Romania versus Ukraine on Monday. So very, very cool, cool games. Uh, El, do you, have a, do, you have, do you have a team? I mean, who do you sort of pin your colors to for the Euros? Yeah, look, I've got a bit of family, family heritage uh, based in Germany. So I've been supporting Germany yeah, okay. my whole life just because my grandmother's German. Uh, it was really good back in 2014, but since then, <laughs> yeah. you know, not much to shout for as a German fan, Steve. Um, but, you know, folks are hosting the Euros this year. Who knows? Anything mm. can happen. Look, truthfully, my money's on England. I think they are well due a major trophy, and they've been knocking on the door for a while now. Um, but for Harry Kane's penalty missing the World Cup and, um, you know, losing the final shocking lead to Italy a couple of years ago, yeah, um, exactly. And, right. and also, yeah, <laughs> it's um, Southgate. Southgate's got a one more chance, I feel. And mm -hmm. if he doesn't, if he doesn't do anything this time, he he's gone, and he knows that. So yeah. it's, it, he's, he's yeah, always I'm, such a polarizing figure, isn't it? Because everybody talks about how negative the football is. For example, you know they often play three at the back. Um, but you know he's gotten to a World Cup semi final. He's gotten to a, a Euros final. So he's been quite close to success. So you know I think it's it'll be amazing to see what his legacy will be because so many people are so ready to have like to get him out and they say you know they don't play to their ability and stuff like that. If he does win the Euros, you know he looks back on his tenure and it's it's been a successful tenure. He's, it's it's difficult one, yeah. isn't it? Because he's such a he's such a down to earth person. Says all the right things. I think genuinely cares. He's quite a refreshing type of personality, but the football has not you know represented the talent and the attacking talent. 
um, that that England have. And I'm an England fan, um, having having a British passport and all. And my mother was born in England, so much like you, I've got sort of family heritage there. So we are very much due. Um, whether we'll, we'll get there. Uh, any sort of dark horses you reckon that that, that are that are worth watching out for? I'm not sure if you can call Croatia a dark horse anymore. Um, yeah, no, they, they, they talk, they're talking about some good for you, a dark horse. Yeah, you know what, Steve? Um, yeah, look, you can't. The, the France have been relatively underwhelming, but they're too big to be called a dark horse. Um, you know, truthfully, Steve, I think we always need to look out for for the likes of a Portugal. Nobody ever really expects yeah. them to win or get far, Ronnie, but they can. They can right surprise you. Can never do so. I mean, every time there's a global event like a Euros or a World Cup, I think surely it's his last tournament. And it never is. And he keeps coming back. He's 45 years old with the body of a 22-year-old, you know. <laughs> like, and scored that's goals. Crazy, he scored two in the friend the other day. Yeah. Um, he's looking, a tank. Looking, looking, no, he is. Um, yeah, I think other, other teams probably, I mean, like, you know, your Austrias, for example, your Polands. Um, Belgium, for example, have, have, for me, have largely underperformed. You know, they were one stage, the one number one title. Oh, yeah. uh, but, you know, have, have yet to really sort of uh, 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 show that on, on, on the national stage in terms of getting to finals. Um, you know, I think that there are, there, are, there, are, there are teams, I mean, Netherlands, for example, we haven't seen Netherlands being as strong as we probably like them to be. So I think we've got an interesting, yeah. an interesting uh, uh, Euros ahead. Um, so in terms of the, the sort of the scheduling for the Euros, it's, it's also pretty short and sweet, to be fair. Um, it's, we've got basically three weeks of uh, round-robin games. First game starts on the, the, the tomorrow, the 15th, sorry, the 14th of June. That final round-robin game on the 26th. So it's basically, yeah, almost two weeks on the, the dot. Round of 16 on the 29th. Uh, the final schedule for the 14th of July. So the entire thing and wraps for up you, in, fans, in a month. It, it is ideal on a Saturday and a Sunday. You've got your 3 o'clock, your 6 o'clock, yeah. your 9 o'clock game. Sit down in the afternoon and just spend the rest of the day watching footy. It is uh, yeah. it's a wonderful thing. Your, week, your weekday, you get, you, you get home for 6 o'clock game, the 9 o'clock game. You know, it's it is from a, from a, from a fan perspective, it's, it's so easy to watch because it's just always there. You just get home and you just put on the footy. Yeah, it's, it's nothing better. Uh, maybe that's why I actually love it so much because it's so accessible. You know, it's so easy to watch and and to get to get involved in it because the timing just works out so nicely from a staffing perspective. That's trouble, though, Steve. I reckon my Betway is in is in trouble here. <laughs> so many games happening in such a short period of time. <laughs> We're gonna see some accumulators there. Eh? So we are, next time we see El, oh, he's either gonna be like a HD camera mic in a podcast studio, or he's gonna be broadcasting out of his car on for like a, <laughs> a weird two hundred rand little smartphone. Trying to pay the debts there. <laughs> yeah, correct. Most likely the latter. Um, yeah, my bets yeah, have well, been going well, speaking of, of bets and favorites and, and things got going and not going well, uh, South Africa, uh, the Proteas, are currently sitting top of their log. Um, no issues, whatever. Basically, they've, they've guaranteed their spot um, in the uh, Super 8, which is the main thing. But... I mean, oh, we're seeing ridiculous cricket, aren't we? Uh, I mean, defending 113 against Bangladesh on, on Monday. Netherlands, you know, chasing down 106, but in the 19th over um, with David Miller, classy 59 of 51. You're having to get us over the line. Let's talk a little bit about the, first of all, let's, let's talk about this, the elephant in the room, this New York pitch, pitches even, you know, the games in the States. For a tournament which is supposed to be really promoting the game, getting Americans in, it's, it's becoming a difficult sell, isn't it? Well, Steve, for a proper cricket fan, I'm, I'm not so sure if it's, it's difficult to sell it to real cricket fans. Um, to the general person in America that's used to watching baseball, I'm sure they would love to see, you know, just hit bash smash 200 runs plus. But as a genuine cricket fan, Steve, I think it's a breath of fresh air to see a pitch that offers something for the bowlers. And where yeah. low scoring games some, 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 can be something I think is putting it very kindly. It's it's there's snake pits out there. It's there's snakes to the grass. Yeah, look, Steve. I don't know. These low scoring games have been absolute thrillers. Um, that the, the point where you're scoring 120 and it's enough, where you might not even defend um, 100. Well, you know, you, you score 90 and you're wondering like, is it enough because of the snake pit of the uh, level of the pitch? It's it's been crazy watching these like second innings chases here. Like with Pakistan scoring 113, chasing 119 against India, that was a crazy game to watch. And 
you know, we've become so accustomed and conditioned to these T20 games, particularly with the seven-year IPL that's just finished, where games were going up to yeah. 260, 270 on the I mean, range. Chase down. It was disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, it was disgusting the scores that were being scored there. Um, it's quite nice to see these low-scoring thrillers again. And um, But now that we're back in the West Indies, I think we're going to see not quite the 200 pitches, but, you know, where... 150, 160, 160 becomes, uh, yeah. I, th- I yeah, think that's, 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 that's what I like yeah. to see. I like I like that 160, 170 type of game because there's still yeah. boundaries, you know, excitement. Um, but it's not it's not silly. You know, the bowlers are still in it. But so I think I think there's yeah. 200, uh, 220, 340. I, I don't find much entertainment in that. I think it just looks like a, a hitting show. Um, I would like to see. I mean, for example, I think. You know, you're watching these 112 games and you're seeing like two sixes in the innings if you're lucky. And the outfields have been really slow, you know. And so yeah, there, is, there, is that, 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 yeah, there, there has been that, which is which has been a bit disappointing. But uh, speaking of disappointing, the Proteus top order have been awful, if we're being brutally honest. Reza Hendricks hasn't got past thing about six or seven. Um, Quinton de Cox not looked good. Adam Markham hasn't scored any runs. Uh, Tristan Stubbs has been better. But the top three in, in serious, serious trouble. I mean, it's a, it's a frustrating situation, isn't it? And that we've got a, basically a nothing game against Nepal on what's it, Saturday morning, so effectively tomorrow night. Um, and Rob Walters basically saying he's not going to change anything. I mean, I suppose he can't. You know, these 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 guys have to go out and try and score some runs going into into the Super Eight. Yeah, Steve. Look, I'm an advocate for Reza out, Rickleton in. Um, I love Brian Rickleton. Um, I don't think it's possible um, because we have to meet quota standards, of course. And without any disrespect to Reza, look, in the past three, four years, he's been immense. But it appears that he's just lost a bit of form. Um, those games before in the West Indies as well, and now in the World Cup, um, I mean, your Reza is batting just about as badly as Coley in this tournament. You know, I never thought I'd say yeah. that. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah but look, um, we are going. We played our first three games at Nassau in New York, where it was a snake pit of a pitch. I'm willing to give the, the opening batsman a, a pass for that. That was, they, they were playing on, you know, like we, we've seen school cricket played on better pitches. Um, okay, we went to the West Indies now where pitches have been actually, you know, in place for years, not set in the ground two weeks ago before the World Cup started. Um, shipped in from some dodgy Australian on a DHL plane, you know. Um, yeah. So real, real quick, it's going to start now. See, we won three out of three. Sure, they were dodgy, not great to watch, but the win is what matters. We're in the Super 8s, and right. we're going to take it from here. I back, I back the top, the top order. It's, it's, there's too much quality there to not succeed. Yeah, I, th- I think that's the big point. You know, according to Cock and Aidan Markham, you know, they, these are these are world class players. You know, Reza Hendricks is yeah. was averaging 50 for a long time in, in T20 cricket for about for that two year stint. So, you know, they will come. Yeah, that's a fact. And you know, they, they always say, you know, when it comes to good players, you know, a, a good score is around the corner, uh, and I think that is the case for for those guys. But I mean, we could be seeing an absolutely mental Super Eight. Currently, we've got USA sitting on. Um, four points ahead of Pakistan um, with uh, USA. I think we've got uh, uh, one more or two more games to go. Pakistan, um, one more game to go. So we could potentially be seeing Pakistan going out, USA progressing. I mean, what a ridiculous result that would be when they, I mean, they beat Pakistan. I'd love to see it. So, I mean, I'd incredible if they it. were to go through. Um, you've got England who are, on the, who are all but out. Uh, Scotland potentially going Obviously, That situation is, I love it because England have to play, I think it's Oman. And um, who's the other team? Namibia. Yeah. Oman and Namibia before the Australia versus uh, Scotland game. So when it gets down to it, England may have the same amount of points as Scotland, and then it comes down to net run rate. And Australia and Scotland would know the exact score that they need to knock in out and to score it in how many overs. And, I mean, look, it will invite chats of match fixing, whether it's happened or not. I'm sure you've heard the chats of Josh Hazelwood the other day. Um, slightly concerning, but I'm sure England fans are busy, um, you know, cucking their pants a little bit right now. Um, the chances of getting knocked out are quite high, and that Scotland team's quality, Steve. They know they know slouches, eh? No. Nah. And this is the thing with T20 cricket as well. You know, you, you, you and I mean, I mean, I've been. It's amazing how bad Ireland have been, for example. I mean, they're going to finish last in a group that features USA and Canada. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. this is what this is the thing with T Twenty cricket is that there's one there's cameos that one player that one day, you know it's such a short format that that you know you need two players to come off on the day and and you could be on on your way home. It, it is 
Uh, you mm. know, test cricket, for example, you know, you, in Ireland will, will hammer a USA and Canada every day of the week. USA have never been in Pakistan in a five-day test, but they beat them in a T20. So it's, it is that which gives the, the bit of a magic of the T20 and that it invites yeah. the upset. Um, and, and that is the, 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 the beauty of it. Uh, in terms of early favorites, Australia looking very strong. Um, oh, you know, probably, the, probably, probably, probably the team to beat. Uh, you know, why, I mean, Australian tournaments like these, they're just, yeah, and, and I mean, this is the, you know, with our players like Fraser McGurk, you make the flipping squad. Uh, they're just a well oiled machine, aren't no. they? No, look, they, they're, they're crazy good, Steve. Um, since the uh, introduction of the World Test Championship, they're looking likely to be the first team to hold every trophy in world cricket, being the championship, 50 of World Cup, and if they win the C20 World Cup too. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I, I think they are going to go on and do it. Um, and they would deserve to. Australia, for the past your few years have just been immense. They win when it matters, and they win well. Um, they, yeah. they, they, under the captaincy of Pat Cummins for the past couple of years, I mean, I know that um, Marsh is the captain for the T20 tournament, but I kind of don't like seeing it, but Australia have almost turned into nice guys uh, under captaincy of Cummins. I've been um, saying that. We need, to get, we, need to, we need to get rid of Cummins and make him, it somebody, you know? <laughs> you know, like bring back David Warner, make him captain. Like, let me hate Australia again. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but look, Australia are very strong. Um, the only team I can really see truly challenging them is India. But India and the ICC tournaments just do not compute. Very similar to the mm-hmm. Proteas. Um, but yeah, I am. Let, let's see how it goes. T20 cricket is volatile. Anything can happen. Yeah, correct. Correct, right, Josh. So, in terms of of just what's what's happening with the T Twenty World Cup, um, the Proteas will play their final game as I mentioned on Saturday morning. It is hoppers one in the morning, so if you're a dedicated fan, you'll be up there. But uh, the next couple of games, you've got the USA taking on Ireland. Uh, that starts as tomorrow. Afghanistan versus Papua New Guinea. But all these games will wrap up on um, the I think the last group stage is on, on the 18th of June. Uh, so next week, Tuesday, before the Super 8, um, will start on Wednesday. By the, the approach will be playing. They, they, we're still waiting to see who will be playing, but um, we are through, so we have already uh, confirmed that. So some of the Super 8 fixtures are already confirmed, by the way. This is also predetermined um, with regards to who's going to be playing who and stuff like that. So West Indies versus South Africa, for example, is already confirmed for Monday, the 24th of June, Australia versus India. Uh, so that's all sort of that, that's slowly filling up, but that'll start the 20th of June. And then the semifinals will be on the 27th and 20, uh, both on the 27th before the final on the 29th of June. Um, so, yeah, exciting times over there. Right, Al, let's get into some predictions, shall we? You are Dester Daniel Skolz's proxy. Stephen is currently leading 10 points to eight. This is a big weekend. We've got two rugby games and we've got a footy game to predict. We're going to start with Sharks versus Leinster. Sharks versus Leinster. Bulls versus Leinster, as if you guys were there. Um <laughs> Shots was uh, I wish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so basically, how it works? Yeah. So, you've heard it. So, basically, we're gonna we're gonna count three, two, one, and we're gonna go team by how many points. All right. All right so, you so do you have a score in mind? I do. I do. All right. Cool. So, I'll, I'll count us in. Are you, are you ready? Sure. Okay. So, three, two, one. Lens to about fifteen. Balls by eight. Yeah, he's gone there. He's gone there. Dan's gonna be Dan's gonna be sitting there like crying, fuming. Massive. Dan has got to play. I'm backing the Bulls. They're gonna do it. Bulls by oh, eight. Yeah, I just think that Leinster at the moment got such a big point to prove. I think missing Curtly and Mark Van Staden and yeah, look, I mean, they don't want to be a team. They don't want to, you know, after choking the Champions Cup. Um, yeah, not having won a trophy since like what 2019 or something like that. that that's yeah, they're, they're, they're going to be pushing, but still, Bulls at home, not just faithful. That Pretoria Sun is what, Steve? That's still going to struggle. It is. It, well, I mean, it's I was there today and it is still warm in the sun. It is it's not as warm as it was a month ago, but it is still, it's still mm-hmm. one day. Altitude still is a factor. Uh, right, Munster versus Glasgow. Do you have a score in mind? Yeah, I've, I've got a score in mind. All right, let's go. So, three, two, one. Munster by four. Munster by 12. By 12. Okay, yeah. okay. So, backing a big one there from, from Munster. I've got a bit more conservative. 
Okay, well, we've got a nice, nice, nice difference here. Me and me and me and me and me and Alt- I mean, me and uh, Dan obviously tend to go quite, quite similar here. Right, the last one is Spain versus Croatia. So obviously the football is a bit different. You go a score line and then Ooh. so two one, whatever yeah. or one nil or whatever and stuff like that. Have you got a score in mind? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, I, I do have a score, Steve. Okay, well, I'll count you in. So we'll go three, two, one. 1-0 Croatia. 2-1 Spain. Okay. Ooh, okay. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Now, I want to see a little smash and grab there from Croatia. Right, okay. So those are our predictions locked in for this week. And that brings us to the end of the podcast. Mr. Block. it has been an absolute pleasure having you as uh, the fan here on Between Two Fans. We will hopefully have our Italian uh, traveler, Mr. Dan Scholz, back on next week. And he can tell us all the stories about his holiday in Sicily as if we actually care. Um, but <laughs> but uh, if you are listening, make sure you smash a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on the various um, streaming platforms, Go and rate us, you know, go and go and go and give us those five stars on Spotify and, and the likes, you know, and, and as usual, send this to your friends, send this to your granny, as we, as we always say, play it for your pets. Um, yeah, send you know, it to your dogs, it's a good one. Yeah, we've just, we had elections, we, we've got an inauguration coming here, send it to your opposition party, you know, send it to Julius, let us know that we're out here, <laughs> um, we will take away all the support that, that we can get. Uh, I'll enjoy the weekend of sport. Yeah, you as well, Steve. And, and thanks for being here. Always, always, always there. And to everybody else, we'll see you guys all next time. Again, please do follow us. Please do give us any feedback on the show as well. As always, it's Stevie P. Um, but this time with uh, Alistair Block, uh, this has been Between Two Fans, and we'll see you guys all next time.